Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all well. On behalf of Good Heart Partners and Asset Value Investors, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar. Presenting this morning is Joe Bornford, CEO and CIO of AVI. AVI is a London-based asset management boutique with 1 billion assets under management across family-controlled holding companies, closed-end funds, and asset-backed situations with a special focus in Japan. During the webinar, Joe will outline AVI's perspective regarding the current net cash opportunity in Japanese equity markets. This will cover valuations with specific reference to portfolio positioning in the AVI Japan Opportunities Trust, as well as providing a more generic reflection on the most recent political and macroeconomic developments in Japan. Before we begin, just a few points to run through. This webinar will be an hour long and it will run as an interactive session where Q&A are encouraged. All attendees microphones are currently muted. If you'd like to pose a question, please raise your hand by clicking the icon located below your screen. If you prefer to send your questions anonymously, then please use the Q&A chat window also at, the also at the bottom of your screen. If you experience any sound problems, it is likely due to a poor connection, so you may want to try calling using any of the numbers listed on the confirmation email. And finally, this webinar will run under Chatham House rules and it will be recorded. Thank you for joining, and with that, I will leave it with Joe to commence his presentation. Thank you, Alina, and good morning to all of you, and thank you very much for joining. AVI Japan uh, was launched two years ago in order to invest in good quality Japanese businesses that were trading at remarkably low valuations, and to exploit those valuation anomalies through active share ownership, through shareholder activism. In this morning's presentation, uh, I'd like to focus the discussion on three areas. Firstly, I'd like to talk about the recently announced political changes in Japan and the implications that they have uh, for our activities there and for Abenomics generally. I'd then like to spend a few minutes talking about the impact of COVID-19 and lockdown on the Japanese economy and again on our portfolio companies. And finally, I'd like to talk about our portfolio, the developments that are occurring there, how we're positioned and the opportunities that we are seeing broadly in Japan. So starting with the political landscape, as you're all aware, there's been a change of political leadership in Japan. Shinzo Abe has retired and passed on and, and um, Mr. Suga has taken over. There's been much discussion about the success of Abe's tenure and of economics in general. But as you see here from a stock market perspective, it's been a pretty positive experience with relatively strong stock market performance over the, the time of, he was in power, and certainly uh, better than most ex-US stock markets, albeit not as good as the uh, US markets. Abenomics comprised of three different arrows. The first two arrows were about monetary and fiscal stimulus, respectively. And the third arrow was the arrow that we're more, most interested in, and that was about structural reform. And specifically, what Mr. Abe targeted was um, two problems. The first was too much cash being accumulated on Japanese company balance sheets that was idly sitting uh, on, those, uh, on those companies' balance sheets and wasn't being spent in the economy and wasn't being used to productive use. And at the same time, shareholders, uh, particularly Japanese institutional shareholders, rarely uh, voiced their, their views and opinions about companies they were invested in. They rarely acted as owners of those companies. And so management were able to get away with policies that weren't particularly helpful to shareholder returns for years, if not decades. And Abenomics tried to change that by introducing a corporate governance code and stewardship code that aimed to, to shift uh, that behavior. And the question on everybody's lips today is firstly, was that a success? And secondly, will we see more of the same? Will we see the same direction of travel from Sugasan, or will this be the end of um, structural reform? In terms of uh, whether it was a success, 
clearly there's a divergence of opinion. But, but when you look at the facts and you look at the, the metrics that we show here on the graphs, the direction of travel has been extremely positive. And we're certainly in a better place today than we were seven years, seven, eight years ago when Arbe assumed power. When you look at dividends and share buybacks, for example, the trend has been uh, very positive. When you look at the number of companies that uh, have cross shareholdings within them, that's been on the decline. Yes, it's still too high, but it's going in the right direction. And then when you look at the number of shareholder proposals and general shareholder activism activity, it's been on the increase. So whilst it's true that more could be done and we could be at a higher level than we are today, the direction of travel is very clear. So I would say that Abenomics has been a success. There's plenty more to do. And you see this reflected very recently, actually, in the last couple of years, in an increase in um, hostile takeover activity, uh, which is something that's been lacking in Japan for, for, for many years. And that is a reflection of animal spirits uh, being fired up, the value that's very, very apparent uh, in Japan, and the fact that more and more domestic and foreign investors are out there seeking to exploit those opportunities. What does the appointment of Suga-san mean? It's obviously early days, but what's very clear is there's not going to be any rowing back on Abenomics. Uh, there's going to be more of the same. We're going to continue with both monetary and fiscal stimulus, and structural reform is going to be a key focus of, of Suga-san. At this stage, uh, we have to see the detail. We've heard talks about him focusing on um, regional banks on strengthening uh, the weaker local economies, the regions, which is where he's from personally, and also about promoting digitalization of the economy, something which is remarkable uh, in a country like Japan, which is so technologically advanced. The fact that so many businesses weren't able to work from home effectively because they didn't have the digital infrastructure to do so, that is a key area of government investment and government focus going forward. So I think we will see um, Suganomics continuing in the way of Abenomics. And it's likely that we'll see Suga-san's personal um, preferences feature as part of his um, structural reforms. So we definitely don't see any cause for concern worry as far as the direction of travel on corporate governance reform goes. In terms of uh, the impact of COVID in, in Japan, uh, it's been remarkably light when you look at other countries, both developed and developing countries around the world. In terms of deaths, in terms of cases, Japan appears to have weathered the storm relatively well. There have been uh, lockdown policies in Japan um, and hospitality and, and restaurant trade generally has operated with uh, some restrictions but by and large uh, the economy has been operating pretty normally and um, that sort of continues uh, as we speak. More relevant to our portfolio is the performance of our companies in a COVID environment and it's clear from here that uh, our companies, like businesses all over the world, suffer to an extent. Uh, we had some companies almost over a quarter of the portfolio that actually were very resilient and delivered growth um, in the periods that were affected by lockdown. And in general, it's fair to say that our portfolio weathered the storm slightly better when one looks at the average sales growth and, and, and guidance estimates uh, in our portfolio on the right-hand side. But there definitely was uh, an impact on profitability and on sales and economic activity in, in, uh, across our portfolio. However, what I think is more relevant is when one looks at what's going to happen in the coming quarters as the economy in Japan and the economy globally starts to normalize, starts to open up, particularly China where uh, there's a lot of production capacity for Japanese companies operating there as 
those uh, markets open up, we are already starting to see earnings revisions rebound strongly. And that is very important uh, for our portfolio, which is comprised predominantly of small and mid-cap companies, which don't have much in the way of sell-side research. They don't have much news coming out intra-quarter. And so the only news that investors see on these businesses on which to base their investment decisions is the quarterly earnings announcements and quarterly guidance. And in the last couple of quarters, when they've seen negative announcements come out, they react adversely. And the corollary of that, we, as we, we're beginning to see, and we expect to see in the next few weeks, as we see the quarter to the end of September results come out, is we'll see a big uptick in earnings guidance and, and results as well. And that should have a positive impact on sentiment towards uh, the companies within our portfolio. When one looks at the behavior of the Japanese market uh, throughout 2020, like the rest of the world, it was a year of two halves, a, a weak first quarter up until the, the end of March, with a recovery since then. What's interesting uh, here is that you see in the blue line is the Japanese small cap growth index. The green line is the value index. Our portfolio is more positioned uh, in line with the, with the value index rather than the growth index. Those are the types of companies that we are seeking to invest in. And as you can see, it's fair to say that although there has been some rally from the March lows, it has lagged um, the growth index. And I think that reflects the fact that so many of the companies uh, within our portfolio and in the value index are more economically sensitive. And we need to start to see, as we are seeing now, uh, opening of economies, resumption of economic activity, and seeing those reflected in the numbers uh, to, uh, to really see uh, that part of the market take off. The other factor that I think is interesting um, about Japan is the impact that foreign capital flows have on Japan and the attitude generally of foreign investors. Uh, we've all seen uh, the announcement a couple of weeks ago that Warren Buffett has made a series of investments into Japan and that has certainly um, tilted sentiment uh, towards Japan. It certainly piqued a lot of interest. We're seeing a lot more uh, interest in, in, in the opportunity in Japan. And although it's not reflected here, in the last couple of weeks, we have started to see a, a pickup in, in, in the foreign flows. And that can be very powerful, has been powerful in the past and is likely to be in the future. Um, as we see sentiment from foreigners uh, shift towards Japan, that does seem to have quite a big impact on the market. So we've spoken about the politics, we've spoken about um, the broad impact that COVID has had. I'd now like to spend some time talking about um, our strategy in Japan, how our portfolio is positioned and the opportunities that we see. As I said at the outset, the objective of ABI Japan's strategy is to focus on a concentrated portfolio of good quality businesses where the companies we invested in have accumulated huge amounts of surplus net cash on the balance sheet. And as you see at the table below here, um, as things stand, almost half of the market cap of our portfolio companies is covered by net cash. And when one adds to that listed securities that are often held on Japanese company balance sheets, you get an NFV or a net financial value covering over 90% of the market cap of these companies. So these companies are remarkably strong from a financial point viewpoint. And it's worth noting that during COVID pandemic and lockdown, no Japanese company had to go hand, cap in hand to banks or to the government um, in order to get financial assistance, no staff, were furloughed. Japanese companies had the resilience and the strength uh, to see the pandemic through. But as I said also, Abenomics, and I expect Suganomics to, to, to focus on the same, was about getting that cash off the balance sheet and put into more productive use. 
And a key tool in order to achieve that objective is shareholder engagement. And the regulators and the government in Japan is very keen to encourage investors such as ourselves from overseas, as well as domestic investors, to engage with, it, with companies and to try and get them to focus more on shareholder returns, to boost returns on equity, and uh, to create value for all shareholders. So the opportunity today, when one looks at valuations, is still remarkable. On the top half of this slide, you see the enterprise value to EBIT valuation uh, of our portfolio companies. It is still uh, below four times, 3.7 times currently. You see we were very um, much lower in the March, in the depths of the March set off at, at 2.1 times. But um, that does reflect the downturn in, in earnings. And as those earnings start coming through, as things stand, uh, we expect the valuation to become even more, more attractive. And clearly, uh, the valuation of our portfolio stacks up remarkably attractively compared to um, the rest of the Japanese market, as well as, of course, uh, the rest of the world. So key really to our strategy and what differentiates us from a lot of our, our, our peers is the willingness and the desire to be a, an activist or an engaged shareholder. And we have a lot of tools in our armory to, to, to approach companies, but fundamental to our approach is the idea that we want to be constructive shareholders. We want to be long-term shareholders and supportive shareholders of the business. And it's important to remember that activism in Japan is different to activism elsewhere in the world. And one needs to be conscious of that uh, in our engagement with companies. So much of our engagement takes place uh, privately in face-to-face -face meetings via written communication uh, to, to companies. And occasionally when things aren't going in the direction we want them to go, or they're not going at the pace we, we want them to, uh, to evolve at, we go public and we have a number of options available to us such as public presentations and shareholder proposals and ultimately there are more extreme tools um, which we consider haven't yet haven't yet employed but may do so at some point in the future but the ultimate objective really is to try and get the companies to understand the advantages of focusing on things like returns on equity on better corporate governance um, and on focusing on, on shareholder returns so within our portfolio, which currently has 27 names in it, um, we've written to all the companies bar one. The one that we haven't written is a new investment, so they will be getting a letter from us. Um, we will have face-to-face -face meetings when we can travel, but we do have a colleague who's based in Tokyo who continues to have face-to-face -face meetings uh, with our companies. And as things evolve, we introduce other um, other tools such as private and public presentations. And as the time of our ownership of these companies extends, and we've been invested in these companies for two, three plus years, then our, our engagement increases and more and more companies will be getting one form or another of presentations and possibly shared proposals too. When you look at our portfolio, and we've got the top 10 here, you see, first of all, it's fairly concentrated. Um, most of the companies are sub a billion pounds market cap. There are a couple of exceptions. It's diversified across a number of different sectors, but it's fair to say that much of our exposure is to the domestic Japanese economy rather than the export-led economy. Um, there's a whole range of cash to market cap. Um, metrics that you see there, but there are some companies that have over 100% cash to market cap, um, some are a little bit lower and very low valuations. And then you see the ownership that AVI has in these companies. And that's a very important um, metric here, because one of the attractions of investing in Japanese companies is that with 1% ownership, we are entitled to submit shareholder proposals uh, to, uh, to annual general meetings. And with 3% ownership, we can call an EGM. Now, 
submitting shareholder proposals is an industry that I would say is in its infancy in Japan. It's not popular. I think there were about 50 proposals submitted last year, and that's been a doubling over the, over the previous three years. But it is certainly growing in popularity, and there are more and more so-called activists in Japan um, fishing for opportunities, and some are submitting shareholder proposals. So one example of our approach to activism and how it can deliver returns for shareholders is uh, Fujitech, which as you saw on the previous slide is our largest holding. It makes up over 9% of our portfolio. We've been invested in this company for a little over two years. Fujitech is one of the top 10 global elevator businesses. And uh, although it's focused on Japan, for the most part, it does have a meaningful exposure to China and other parts of Asia. And like all elevator businesses, the attractions of this business come from uh, not the installation of the elevators and escalators, but really from the long-term maintenance contracts that provide stability uh, and growing profits really, to the companies over, over a long period of time. And we've seen a lot of corporate activity in the elevator business globally. Um, amongst some of the larger players. And uh, in Japan, Fujitech has remained closed to outside takeover activity thanks to its poison pill that it has, it has in, in its place. Fujitech is, a, is an attractive business. Um, it's trading at, has been trading at a remarkably low valuation. To put that into context, um, you see here on this slide, uh, back in February, March, it was trading at five times EV EBIT. It's gone up now, but global peers trade closer to 20 times EV EBIT. So that, that's a sign really of how undervalued uh, Fujitech really has been. Now, AVI's approach has been uh, from the early days of our investment to meet with management to try and uh, get them to understand what they can do to um, improve the valuation of their company and the importance of doing that. And Having not made much progress, earlier this year, we launched a dedicated website and we published a 75-page presentation highlighting a number of deficiencies on the capital allocation front, on the corporate governance front, on the operational front, and on various strategic uh, fronts that were lacking, and really started to bring the intellectual debate about what Fujitech ought to be doing to the broad shareholder base and try and use that to exert greater influence on management and also to encourage other investors uh, to articulate those same views to management so that we're not the only people uh, saying something uh, to, to management. Since the publication of our uh, report, the share price of Fujitech has been extremely strong. We've outperformed the topic substantially and have yet not gone particularly aggressive we haven't submitted any shareholder proposals. We haven't called any e EGMs. We haven't sought um, any changes to the board structure. Uh, but it certainly seems to have attracted a lot of attention uh, from other investors, both within Japan and overseas. And we are seeing increasingly that the approach to activism in Japan is moving away from simply asking for more dividends, asking for share buybacks, changing the boards, to these bigger prize initiatives, which are focused on operational and strategic initiatives, which are important because we want to gather the support of as many shareholders as possible. And for Japanese institutional shareholders, something that creates value for very long-term shareholders, something that makes Japan, Japan's economy stronger, is something that they're much more likely uh, to support. So it's been a, a tough environment, certainly this year, I, I would say, since we launched. Um, in terms of NAV growth, we've achieved 13% uh, total return since launch, which is comfortably ahead of our benchmark, uh, the MSCI Japan, small cap Japan. But importantly, um, the key thing is from a valuation perspective, uh, Japan and, and this opportunity, our portfolio stacks up remarkably, remarkably well. It's still unbelievably cheap. And in terms of activism and the, the movement to unlock a lot of that value, we've made a lot of progress in the last two years. 
things have developed uh, in a positive way, there is much more engagement activity going on and companies themselves are much more open to shareholder engagement and to changing their ways. And you see that with a, a very substantial increase we've seen in share buyback activity over the last, last two years. So there's a lot to go for and the stars appear to be line, lining up pretty well for more developments on the corporate governance and shareholder activism front. And finally, uh, just to highlight uh, the depth in our team, since we've launched uh, the strategy over two years, almost two years ago, we've expanded uh, the AVI Japan team quite substantially. As I mentioned earlier, we've, we've um, appointed a senior consultant, Jason Bellamy, who's a Japanese national, uh, despite his name, based in, based in Tokyo. And he's been meeting our companies uh, throughout lockdown. We've appointed two Japanese analysts to work with us in London and, and have got some support staff as well. Uh, all of whom speak Japanese and uh, based in London working with us. So the team has substantially grown, which is enabling us to get involved in that very detailed, in-depth activism that is becoming well received by Japanese com companies and that is likely to uh, unlock a lot of value in the coming years. So we have a dedicated Japan fund, uh, ABI Japan Opportunities Trust, uh, which is listed on the stock exchange. It's currently about 130 million pounds in size. And there are other uh, opportunities for investing in our Japan strategy as well. If you want to speak to uh, myself or Alina, then we'd welcome your, your input. And with that, I'll end and open the uh, floor to any questions. Thank you very much for that, Joe. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one of which is from an anonymous attendee, and that's what type of companies did Buffett invest in? So Buffett invested in um, the large um, conglomerates, companies like um, Mitsui and Mitsubishi, uh, which are large conglomerates, very diversified portfolios. I would say quite sleepy management, um, clunky companies with exposure to uh, quite cyclical industries. They are, I would say, a, a, a way of playing um, the broad Japanese industrial um, economy with exposure to, to the global economic cycle as well. But they're quite clunky, and our preference is uh, to exploit opportunities further down the market cap spectrum, which are less well-researched and more inefficiently priced. And we've got a question from Andrew Wynn. Two questions, in fact, from Andrew Wynn. Um, one of which is, internally, how do you gauge the return on investment from your various shareholder activism efforts? And the other is, where have your efforts, in your opinion, failed, and how have you chosen to reflect that in your portfolio? through a reduction of position size or elimination of the holding? Okay, so um, the first question is how we gauge the, the impact of our shareholder activism campaigns. Um, the objective really of investing in these companies when we, when we seek these opportunities, we see um, upside in the order of 50 to 100%. Uh, in very simple terms. And that really is really is our objective. And the basis for, for giving that number really is what we've seen when we've had um, takeover activity affect our portfolio. Those are the kind of premia that we've seen achieved on, on takeover. And that really is a reflection of the undervaluation, the scale of the undervaluation. So whilst that's our, our objective, what's more difficult to measure when we achieve those returns, hopefully, is how much of that has come about from our, uh, our input. And that, it, that is hard to measure, and it's not an exact science. And in some cases, uh, if we're honest with ourselves, we've uh, ridden a wave maybe that somebody else has, has led, or we've had no impact, um, and that's fine. We've still invested in cheap opportunity and identified that. In other cases, such as in Fujitech, I think it's clear that we have been leading the way. 
and um, a lot of the interest and a lot of the share price response that we've seen in the last three months, I think is very much uh, down to us. So I, I would say it's a mix, um, which is why we, we have a diversified portfolio. We focus on a number of characteristics within these companies when we think about the upside and the catalysts really for achieving, uh, achieving that upside. Um, you're right, it doesn't always go our way. And in some cases, um, we have to put our hands up and say it's not going to work. Uh, when we invest in, in, in these situations, we typically expect that we're not going to know for certain whether our efforts are futile or not until we've been invested for at least two to three years. We need to go through a couple of AGM cycles till we see um, how our relationship is developing, whether we need to submit proposals, and what the response from other shareholders is going to be. But having now invested in these kinds of companies um, for, for the best part of three years, we are beginning to see um, one or two situations where perhaps uh, there are easier, easier ways to make money, there are easier targets for us to focus on. And in that situation, our response really has been to eliminate the holdings, to not get too emotionally attached. Yes, they're still very cheap, but they're probably in the value trap bucket more than anything else, and to move on and do something else. Thank you, Joe. Um, sure. Just to follow up on that, when engaging in shareholder activism, do the team look at any ESG factors? Yeah, I mean, we do look at ESG factors, um, and obviously it's a, a very live, live topic at the moment. Um, G is fundamental to what we're doing. So in terms of, of, of governance, uh, that is a primary focus, and we spend most of our time talking to companies about improving corporate governance. But that's not to say that the E and the S part isn't important. Um, we want to invest in companies that uh, are likely to continue to grow their profits um, for many years in the future. We don't know how, how successful our activism is going to be and the timing of such success. And therefore, we have to be comfortable owning those businesses for the duration and we want to see their earnings grow. And a key part of um, the ability of many companies to continue to grow is to have good standards of um, the E and the S part of G as well as the G. So yes, we do talk to, to companies about that as well. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'm going to team two questions together. Um, one of them from an anonymous attendee. It seems like you've expanded the team, especially with Japanese speaking nationals. Will this allow you to engage with more companies this year? And I'm going to follow that up with um, a question again from Andrew. And that's how do you window the universe of small cap companies down to an effective shareholder activism oriented universe for, attra for attractive candidates? Okay, so um, the team, we very much expanded the team so that we can engage with more companies um, proactively and so that we can expand the depth of that engagement. Increasingly, we're seeing that as we develop positive relationships with companies, and as they start responding to us, um, they're very interested to hear our ideas for what they can do to improve their businesses. It's fair to say that a lot of these small mid-cap companies are not the most sophisticated uh, when it comes to, to, to management, and I mean that with the greatest respect, and some are open to our ideas, and having the ability to feed those ideas in a constructive private dialogue with management is uh, hugely beneficial to our strategy and did require us to, to expand our team. And certainly having uh, Japanese speakers makes the whole process a lot more uh, efficient. So whether that results in more public campaigns, it, it's hard to say, it's too early to say at this stage, but it certainly does increase the, the level of detail uh, that we are engaging with in private uh, behind the scenes. And I think that's very positive. Um, the second question was how we um, window the, the universe into sort of effective shareholder um, campaign candidates, I think. And um, it's a good question. 
because in order for our campaigns to be more effective, we need to have the support of as, as broad a base of shareholder as possible. And one of the issues that Japan clearly faces is the issue of cross shareholders who act in their own interests rather than in the interests of, of other shareholders. So we, we screen a small cap universe of net cash companies. We screen down for quality in terms of looking for businesses that are, have got a growth trajectory and have a history of delivering growth. And um, we look at the, the broad quality of the business, but we also look at the shareholder register in order to determine whether we're just going to be a lone wolf banging our head against the brick wall, or whether we're likely to find support from across the shareholder base um, for the kind of things that we are, saying, we are seeing. Clearly, a company that has got a large proportion of its register in the hands of foreigners is likely to be more um, supportive of our measures. But very, very importantly, and increasingly so, we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months, a really shift, a real shift in attitude from Japanese domestic institutions in their attitude towards engagement uh, with companies. And increasingly, they are saying the same things we are saying. They are kindred spirits. They don't like the publicity that much. So they say things in private. But that is certainly adding to the weight uh, of, of our arguments. So really key to determining which of the 20 to 30 companies we invest in is thinking about the broad shareholder register and the likelihood of them singing from the same hymn sheet as we are. Thank you, Joe. Um, we've got a question from Hamish Wilson. In cases where you are successful with your engagement and activism, what are your sell triggers? It is, enti is it entirely valuation based or might you prefer to then back them over a longer period given your success? Yeah, I would say that um, valuation is paramount here and, and really the strategy is exploiting the inefficiencies, the under, undervaluations that exist because of the inefficient balance sheets and the cash on the balance sheets. So where we see uh, those start to diminish, the attractiveness of those fundamentals start to diminish, um, the likelihood is we will be seeing more attractive opportunities elsewhere in, in the market and we would shift the portfolio in favor of those. Um, the ultimate objective really is to achieve some form of corporate change of control, uh, which would force us out in any case. And that's, I think, the, the, the ideal way of um, realizing a lot of that undervaluation. Um, it is sometimes tempting from an emotional perspective to stay invested in good businesses and ones that are delivered for us. But I think uh, we, uh, want to stay true to our fundamental valuation approach, which has to be driven by the upside in value and, and the cash on the balance sheet. Joe, we've got two questions on your SoftBank group holding. Um, one of them is from an anonymous attendee, and that's um, given the holding position is a large cap stock, what is your thinking behind this investment and your views on its governments or its ability to engage in activism? And I'm gonna follow that up with a question from Simon Evan Cook, and it's, can you talk us through the SoftBank holding in light of recent developments? Okay, sure. Um, so SoftBank, uh, as you rightly point out, is an exception in the sense that it is a large cap stock. And whilst the focus of uh, AJOT, AVI Japan, Opportunity Trust is predominantly on small and mid cap uh, opportunities, we do have the ability to invest a minority, small part of the portfolio in large cap opportunities, where we see uh, similarities in terms of uh, the strength of the balance sheet and a shareholder activism catalyst uh, in play there. So, uh, broadly speaking, uh, that's how SoftBank fits in to, to the mandate. In terms of uh, the specifics about the investment thesis uh, around SoftBank and, and specifically the governance, uh, I think it's a very, very interesting uh, situation right now. And frankly, I think it's one of the most compelling of investment opportunities that we see globally in fact. Um, for many years, we were intrigued by SoftBank. It, it, it uh, had a interesting portfolio. It 
was kind of family controlled and it traded at a substantial discount. But the conclusion we had for many years was that it was really uninvestable because there was no catalyst really for unlocking that discount and the governance was weak and we couldn't have any confidence in the alignment of interest that existed. And that changed earlier this year, back in February, uh, when Elliot took a very large stake and started uh, pressing management to do something about their very wide discount, which in fact reached over 70% in March of this year. And specifically the things that they were asked to do um, were to make asset disposals, to raise cash, to reduce debt, to buy back shares. And as you'll appreciate, buying back a large proportion of your company on a massive discount is hugely accretive uh, to the NAV for ongoing shareholders. And to improve the corporate governance by making changes to the board structures and um, having greater transparency on parts of the portfolio that were worrying many investors and observers. Now, a lot of the press articles that you've seen over the last few months and the analyst and journalist commentary has focused on the disastrous investment in WeWork, the suspicious activities of the Vision Fund. Latterly, it's about um, trying to corner the options market in highly valued tech stocks. None of that is particularly good, and it does raise questions about the corporate governance. But to put it all into context and to focus really on the fundamental picture here, all of those things represent a tiny proportion of the overall value within SoftBank. The investment in Alibaba makes up almost 70% of the valuation of SoftBank. So if you're constructive on Alibaba, and you think about the other catalysts that are in place to narrow the discount and to deliver shareholder returns, then you start getting a much more um, compelling investment case. And that really has been our view. We are constructive on Alibaba. We see the discount, certainly 70 to 60% today is being unsustainable. We see the stars aligning in terms of everything that the company has done uh, at Elliot's request. And it's fair to say at our request as well, because we, although we have a smaller shareholding than Elliot, we do engage with the company uh, quite proactively and they do respond, respond to what we say. So we've seen them deliver on more asset disposals than they've promised. They've been doing the buybacks as they've promised and promised to continue to do them. And there's a powerful alignment of interest in that Massa Som, the founder, clearly is frustrated by the discount and wants to own more of his company at as cheap a price as possible. And if the discount doesn't get re-rated by the market, as he's indicated on two or three occasions recently, uh, he'll consider taking the company private. And that creates a powerful alignment of interest for us. And that really is how we, we think about the various uh, components of SoftBank. It's not brilliant on corporate governance. It's not going to be a 10-year holding for us. But right now, it's a special situation um, driven by the strength of the asset disposals in combination with the share buybacks and the powerful alignment of interest that exists, all underwritten really by a constructive view that we have on Alibaba as a very attractive business. Thank you, Joe. Um, another question from Hamish Wilson, and that's how many of the issues you are engaging with on different companies are similar to each other? Do you ever encourage portfolio companies to collaborate, creating any kind of network effect? Oh, that's interesting. We haven't, we haven't as yet asked uh, any companies to collaborate. Uh, we do have some overlap uh, in terms of sector exposure, and it's a useful window, I would say, into sort of how companies' peers are, are, are doing. Uh, it certainly is a possibility at some stage. Um, and, you know, I think increasingly Japanese management company managements are interested in M&A and spending their cash pile in a productive way. So it's a possibility, but as yet, um, we, haven't, we haven't yet employed that. Okay, I'm also gonna team two questions up together. One of them is from an anonymous attendee, and that's what size are you aiming to grow AJOT? 
and a follow up with a question from Andrew Wynn. In your, opi in your opinion, since the launch of Ajon, do you need to migrate up the market cap spectrum in order to achieve your activism aims? So the first question in terms of size, um, the board have set a target uh, of getting to 200 million pounds. So as I said earlier, we're about 130 million pounds. So we have the capacity to issue stock and, and grow the trust uh, to that level. Um, in terms of migrating up the market cap spectrum, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, I don't think so. There are huge numbers of opportunities and the most crazy valuations exist at the smaller cap end of the spectrum. And the reason we've set the cap at around 200 million pounds is because we want to be able to invest in those fantastic situations and we want the results of those to have sufficient impact to move the needle of our returns. So I wouldn't want to be running a, a portfolio that was so large that I couldn't invest in those gems at sub 100 million pounds. But having said that, uh, there has been more interest in shareholder activism and you've seen the likes of Elliott and Third Point target very large companies. And so there has been a more, a, a more of a focus on large cap activism. And that may create opportunities for us as we go forward. And we expect where we expect it to have an impact is we expect it to see a trickle down effect uh, on the rest of the market as the small companies see what's going on in the big companies, it alters the behavior down there. So we may have one or two more larger cap situations, but the focus is going to remain on the small cap. Thanks, Joe. Um, we've got another question from an anonymous attendee, and that's, did you contact other shareholders in Fujitech during your campaign? Um, yes, very much so. We contacted other shareholders, but many other shareholders came out of the woodwork and contacted us when they saw the presentation. And that's a very powerful force um, because the more shareholders that speak to the company and say the same things, the more likely the management of the company is to be open to the suggestions we make and to get the impression that shareholders are not happy. So uh, it, it very much a key part. And in fact, the regulators in Japan are very keen to encourage collaboration and discussion uh, between shareholders in situations that they're mutually invested in as a key tool to improve governance and, and generate shareholder returns. So um, it's one of the advantages of sort of going public. It does invite uh, discussion from others. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, increasingly Japanese investors are taking an interest in, in this kind of collaboration, which is very positive. And Joe, where would you put the opportunity in Japan today relative to the past 10 years? I think it's extremely, extremely compelling. Um, Japan has been slow to change and has frustrated many investors. But from a valuation perspective, it stands out a mile from the rest of the developed world. From a corporate governance perspective, which we've spoken a lot about, um, the pace of change has been slow, but it has been moving for sure, and it's been moving in the right direction. And I always think back to um, what um, a senior officer at the FSA in Japan told me a couple of years ago. He said, don't underestimate the commitment of Japan to change. You just have to be conscious of the fact that Japan is a very traditional society and it takes a long time to change. But once they do change, they remain committed to that change. And I think that's what we're seeing now. Uh, we've had five years of corporate governance and, and stewardship code. We've had a few years of shareholder engagement activities such as ours starting to make an impact. And we're really starting to see that, that shift in behavior emerge. So I think the combination of remarkably low valuations, as cheap as they've been at any time in the last 10 years, but, but now finally with a catalyst uh, to unlock that value is um, a fantastic, really op fantastic opportunity for Japan. And finally, um, the other attraction really of Japan is that particularly amongst the small cap sector, it really is a, a play on the global economy. It's, it's very sensitive 
to changes in, in global growth. And it is a, having not participated fully in the rally since March, it is a fantastic way to get exposure to the normalization of the economies, the opening up of the economies around the world and the rebuilding of economic activity. Um, thanks, Joe. Ideally, what should your portfolio turnover be in 24 months, assuming that there is an appropriate cadence to shareholder activism? Well, in a normal year, we'd expect to see um, somewhere between three and five um, successes. And those successes can come from our efforts, the kind of things that we see in Fujitech, um, our performance delivered from our presentation and our shareholder activism activities, and also from the kind of things we saw at the end of 2019 when two of our holdings were taken over by their parent, Toshiba Corporation. So it, that's in a normal year. 2020 has not been a normal year. And I think it's, it's fair to accept three, expect three or four holdings to be eliminated um, because of success. And as I mentioned earlier, to be realistic, we may have one or two, um, if not failures, but things that we need to move on from and do better things with our capital. So I suppose that speaks about a um, somewhere in between 15 and 25% turnover. Thanks, Joe. I'm going to conclude with uh, two last questions, which whole team together. Um, one of them is noting your global portfolio. Is Japan a value outlier? And why do you think that overseas investors are so underweight in Japan? And do you see signs of that changing? Uh, I mean, very much so. Japan is a value outlier. Um, uh, our global strategy is designed to exploit inefficiencies and opportunities around the world. Um, we are heavily overweight in Japan, and that's for all the reasons that I've spoken about this morning. Uh, Japan is uh, attractive. That's not to say there aren't other attractive opportunities elsewhere. There are, but Japan broadly as a market does stand out as something very interesting. Um, I think there are a number of factors why uh, Japan has been neglected and overlooked by foreign investors. The, as has been well documented, the market over the last decade since the end of the financial crisis has been driven by um, growth stocks, by tech stocks in particular. In terms of markets, it's been all about the US and about China. You get those right and nothing else really matters. We've seen um, a big move towards passives across the industry. And um, that just sends money towards, sends capital towards the largest companies and leaves others to be neglected. So those are the broad industry trends that uh, Japan really has had to contend with. And then from a domestic perspective, Japanese investors have been slow to uh, invest in their market. There's been a lot of talk about deflation and aging population and growing central bank balance sheet and all of those things. And that has just deterred uh, investors from looking at Japan. We, um, whilst I said that the broad trend continues to be one of negative flows, uh, over the last three to four weeks, really since Buffett announced his investments, we've started to see that turn. We have started to see interest come our way from potential investors and from the press and from commentators generally towards Japan. And it feels there's a, a kind of a sense that um, Japan is worth another look and it's a reminder that it is cheap and shouldn't be neglected at all costs. So that's, that's the sense that we're getting at the moment. Thank you, Joe. I think we're out of questions. So with that, we'll wrap up a few minutes early. Um, again, thank you for this morning's presentation and thank you to everyone who participated. I hope you all found it useful. If you have any more questions or would like to receive the presentation, then please get in touch and we will get back to you. Till then, have a great week ahead. Thank you.